Nick, it's Q&A time. Let's go. We got a question. These are my favorite. These are my favorite. I uh, mine too. We got a question from Hendra on YouTube. When's the next Q&A? It's right now. Let's go, Hendra. Thanks for the softball. First question other than Hendra from Dan M via email. And by the way, if anybody wants to send us questions, we will go through our comments on YouTube and the email address, fullgrainpodcast at gmail. You can email us your questions there. Hey guys, found the podcast, loving it. Couple ideas. How about an episode or part of an episode decoding some of the terms used to describe leather? I'm thinking particularly of terms used to describe leather's appearance. Sometimes I think I know what it means, but I'm not really sure. For example, sugary. Yeah, and there are like a lot of made up or words that don't seem to make any sense, like sugary and uh, like punky is what I've heard and like torn and there's like there's a lot of and like I have no idea I mean they seem to make sense like when you look at it but you would never like, really understand where the word came from but um, punky's a new one for me you want to start with punky <laughs> I, I mean I don't know it's just like I guess punky's kind of like everything's bad <laughs> yeah uh that's a, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, attribute that one to John Culleton. Is that kind of like raspy? No, it's more like, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like, you just kind of have to, you see, well, you know, when you see it, no, I don't know. It's a, uh, like the break is kind of runny. Like there's another word, like it's not like it starts to, like if you crease it, it doesn't really want to like crease in one spot. It just sort of like wants to keep going and it can be a little bit rough and it can, I mean, it's just sort of, it's kind of hard to. Is a, isn't a punk what you use other than a genre of music, but isn't that what you use to like light things? It's kind of like a, it looks like an incense mm-hmm. and you like light stuff with a punk, like fireworks. Google sure. it. I think I might be right. I could be totally wrong. Let's just go with that. Sugary is one. I mean, it's sort of like you, when you finish it, it's, it's kind of describing what the, grain and the finish are doing together and it looks it looks almost like you're getting like little tiny like individual like sugar crystals i guess i mean look you you would see it and you're like oh that's i understand why that's would be called sugary so there's that what else do we write down round is like a is like something that feels like very dense and robust and like you when you bend it it sort of gives you resistance and feels and feels supple and full without feeling like it's going to collapse on itself like if you were to make it into something i don't know it's kind of hard you made me think of it maybe the antonym of that would be like raggy yes if something's like really soft (laughs) another term yeah 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 that's like lifeless no no body it just kind of like wants to feels like it wants to just like fall apart yeah um what else do we well speaking of full what's full's an interesting one these are more like feel uh, descriptors. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. He said, he said appearance, huh? Okay. So yeah, bright is just means shiny and dull just means matte. This is not going well right now, <laughs> by the way. Well, I mean, there's a, there's any number of, uh, like descriptors that you could use for how like a pebble pattern looks like if it's a larger pattern or a smaller pattern i guess that you could describe it different ways um a cool visual like a, texture thing that we don't talk about a lot is like a hammered print yep and a hammered print if you can imagine a football texture for example or a basketball texture those round peaks of the texture you take a bit of sanding paper to it and you you knock off the peaks so you're hammering down the texture to be a little bit more flat it's actually a really i think the hammer texture is pretty cool it's cool because you can do, we were just doing some football like that and we did, because the, the natural football color is kind of like an oatmeal color. And so we finished the football black and then hammered it. So you would, you brushed off, we would do sand it off the tips of the pebbles and then it was like an oatmeal color on top of, and then the black, like all in the valleys. It's a cool, it's a, it's a pretty cool look. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it, it works well, or I think it looks good in that high contrast scenario, but that's not for everywhere. So it's pretty intense. Yeah. I mean, grainy is a good one because I think I use the word grainy as if I know what I I imagine everybody knows what it means, but that's, that is a really confusing one. 
Because I think people don't even really know what the grain is. But when I think of the grain, it's, it's those small hair holes or, or where the hairs were before the leather was leather. And you can have a very grainy appearance. Actually, I was looking at some horse woolly, Chicago woolly today. I don't, this is a lot of descriptors. Essentially, I was looking at some horse grain today and it was super, super grainy. Um, there's different methods of drying and even just inherent grain types that are more pronounced uh, or will make the grain more pronounced. So for this example, I've noticed the grains on horse fronts or even horse butts are very, very intense. Those hair holes are really pronounced. And I'll just give one example of the drying method that makes it even more accentuated is the toggling of leather tends to make the grain um, less compacted into it's a little bit more of a raised grain and it makes it even more further pronounced. Yeah, it shrinks. It's allowed to shrink a little bit. So everything sort of shrinks back and then it like stands up a little bit, I guess is like the, the best way to envision it. But yeah, the ho I mean, horse is a good example because I mean, so the grain, how grainy something is, is just a function of how coarse the hair is. So calf skin is very fine grain because the animals are younger and the hair is super fine. And then something like a horse hide, particularly like, like if you look at the mane, which is very, very coarse, like it's even the mane, you can tell easily tell the difference between that and the rest of the, the rest of the horse hide. So it's, um, it can be pretty striking at times, but I think that here's another term draw. I think that sometimes people conflate draw and grain because draw is like that wrinkling kind of effect that you get. Um, you see it a lot in the horse butts. Yeah. It sort of looks like it's, it's hard. <laughs> spider webby I've, almost. I struggle with like providing a good, like real world example. I like how to, what to compare it to. Like sometimes you see like huge bald dudes that have like really wrinkly heads. Like it's kind of <laughs> like that, I guess. Like it's not, it's like a, it's like a structural thing. It's not a, it's not really a reaching on that thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying because it's not it's not the easiest thing to picture if you don't know if you don't know anything about leather like if you haven't seen it it's kind of hard to it kind of looks like a, a yeah. web of sometimes yeah and it's not necessarily even a feel texture it's more of just like a visual texture and, and to co contrast the term of draw against the term fat wrinkles they sort of have the same visual uh, characteristics but the fat wrinkles you can much more feel a difference in texture at least in the tannery the differentiation between those two is the a fat wrinkle is something that you can't really control that's just inherent to the animal like for example you get a heavier like steer hide the neck has fat wrinkles in it because it's just like it was a big animal and like it had a big neck and stuff was creased up there where draw can be the result can be inherent to the hide like that but it can also be a result of the tanning process if things shrink or mostly if things shrink too quickly then you can things can sort of bunch up and get that get that look to it um or if things are too hot or too cold or you know t ph i mean there's a bunch of different ways usually it's it's if it's not something that's in the hide already it's usually you're you've done something that you don't necessarily want to do but, correct me uh, if i'm wrong on this yeah. one it feels like fat wrinkles are often perpendicular to the backbone where draw is parallel to the backbone more or less. Yeah. I mean, fat wrinkles, I think are most often, I mean, since they're in the neck, yeah, they're, they run, they, they're perpendicular. And I think the draw is kind of like all, cause if you look at some of the draw that you see on horse side, it's like everywhere. It like, mm. doesn't, it doesn't really follow any, but I'm not, I mean, maybe on other hide types, it's different. I mean, my, my experience is somewhat limited to the deer, bison, horse steer world yeah i guess that's i want to hop life. back we were talking about graininess and they were calling our yeah. last conversation with nick from stridewise he was really into wild boar and one of the things about the grain character on that boar is it's also very intense but very patchy like i can look at a i'm actually not great at every animal but i can look at many animals now and go like that's a boar you can quickly tell the, the difference in the grain character um, and I think it's, you can tell from looking at the leather or like a picture of the animal. <laughs> I can tell from looking at the leather. <laughs> okay. You can too. I'm sure like the pig skin uh, stuff or the boar stuff. Yeah. I don't know. 
I mean, maybe. It's uh, like they're if in like, like little a, patches. The, yeah. The, yeah. Or ostrich is like very obvious. Yeah, that's these types of things. Yeah. So every animal has its own inherent grain character. Uh, there's a second part to Dan's email, which more or less is about hunting deer and then using the skins and home tanning. Are you familiar with home tanning, Nick? I mean, I'm familiar with the concept. I uh, I mean, since I grew up in a tannery, I never really had to spend any time thinking about home tanning because I could just go to a tannery. But um, yeah, no, I've, I, I, there's a number of different ways to do it. And I mean, th- that I means vegetable tanning is thousands of years old because it was done. You can do it on a really small scale, you know, with sort of what's what you find around you in terms of the the tree barks. I mean, oak is one of the things that gets used a lot and that's everywhere or that's in a lot of places. Um, but I'm not super familiar with brain tanning. I know that that's he was mentioning that and I know that's a very traditional thing and it's one of those things that I see and then I'm like, oh, I should research what that is and then I just never <laughs> do. And I just never do. But I would assume that there's something, I mean, most definitely there's something in some sort of enzyme or something that's in the brain so that when you like rub it on the hide, it's, do, it's doing something then it's something that you want from a preservation standpoint, whether that's from an like enzymatic standpoint, I would have to do some more research. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a, we can go into like different types of tanning episode and we can talk about, I've seen people do go it. from old to new. Yeah. I've seen people do this sort of idea on their own and I've seen YouTubers. There's a couple guys that show you how to do it. And if you're not too scared of ruining your stuff and putting in a bunch of work, you might want to get some books and try it. Cause I, some of that technology is not, um, it doesn't, I've never done it myself. So I should guess I shouldn't speak out of turn, but it doesn't appear to be, uh, super technologically advanced. Like you could do it in like a little bin you know yeah so maybe i think you just need, try out i think that if you can just you probably I, mean, I should look it up i don't know <laughs> brains and salt and sunlight and something to stretch the hide on is probably all you really need scrape the hairs off yeah yeah, yeah. so a bit of work probably pretty rewarding especially if he's able to do some leather working after that with the deer skin i would say it might be difficult to get a tannage that is appropriate for the examples that you wrote in here dan uh, it sounds like you're looking to get a wallet, watch trap, and gloves out of them. Sometimes the thickness can be a bit of an issue on some of those types of projects, and sometimes the temper can also be a, a further issue. So you might have like a really soft and drapey wallet, for example. Is drapey another word? That's another word, yeah. Raggy. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, though. Yeah, like it doesn't have any stand. It just sort of wants to fall over. So good questions yeah, there from Dan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, sorry. I sh- I, I'm going to do some more work on. I'm going to do some more research on brain tanning. I should have. I should have. Uh, Maybe next episode we'll do a whole brain tanning thing. I should. I don't think so. Unless hey, you got a guest. <laughs> we could <laughs> that actually. That's not a bad idea. Find a brain tanner. All right. Uh, another one here from EDH Boulevard. Hey Nick, can you give some perspective on leather delays? My Nick's order has been delayed over a month due to Predator Orange not being delivered. WCF, Nick. <laughs> yeah. It's, and by uh, the way, I think this email, this YouTube comment um, from EDH, I believe was back in December. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully we've, we've delivered that by now, but maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's funny, but Let not us funny. Know. But yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's like any, it's like any other manufacturing place. I mean, it's, we're, we are waiting to receive raw materials and like so the, for example the the predator requires a certain kind of hide type or is best is best suited you know or there's a, there's a, high, a certain hide that's best suited to be made into predator um so we're sort of we we order hides by the truckload and then we sort them into individual sort of categories so there's a category that predator gets pulled out of so we're, we have to wait until that category has hides in it. It usually does. 
you know, and then it's sort of off to the races. It's, you know, holi- are there holidays or are there other material delays? What time of the year is it? Does it take longer? Is it taking longer to dry? Um, did we get the color right the first time? Or do we have to adjust the color in finishing? Do we make the color wrong completely in retanning? So we have to completely start over for, at that point. And, and then there's personnel. I mean, people, it's hard, it's, it's hard to get steady people at this point. So we've, for, for us, we've had, we've, we've had the desire to put more pieces through our facility and we've been sort of, we've been limited as of late by just in terms, just in terms of just qualified people. So that's, that's definitely part of it. But, you know, there's, that, that I guess that that was probably I would have to look at the order because I'm sure I could find out, but that's what I would assume on the predator side of things. But if you look at, I mean, different products have different challenges. I mean, some take just take a long time, and there's nothing that you can do. So if you know, for like on the Cordovan side of things, like if we aren't able to get the big horse sides that we like at a certain point in time then we can't put the, we can't make the stuff. And then the, the, you know, it's six months from the time we put it in. So delays are, delays are passed on at a, in a very delayed uh, yeah. fashion. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's always unplanned. We have got, we give lead times or delivery dates based on, you know, historical experience and, and, they are often subject to change, unfortunately. You you went a few different ways that I wanted to go with that, but maybe I'll just leave it there because the next question is from Voltaine that was emailed. Voltaine wants to know pr- about more about Predator. Speaking of Predator, how maybe you could just describe what that leather is for me, but he's asking how the leather's made. He's heard it's made with hard waxes and just wondering how that leather was developed and came about. That's a good question, actually. That that leather is probably it's I think it's more than fifteen years old at this point. Maybe my, it's twenty years old. My number was gonna be fifteen, but I guess I yeah, don't really know. It was it was because I've been there for fifteen years and that was already and that's and that's you know, for us that's newer. But that that was already in you know in the books when I started uh full time. So I'm not sure I'm not sure what the development process was like for that. I I think, I mean, based on how it looks, I would, I would guess that maybe there were some new waxes or finishes that that sort of come about and we were experimenting with new products in that regard on exist, like an existing base tannage. And there was probably an initial promise that through the commercialization process got adjusted from start to finish until it was something that was saleable in terms of you know, how soft it was and consistency and, and, uh, or soft temper, how it looked and aged and, and all that stuff. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a chrome tanned leather with a hard wax on the surface and it has this, has like a distressed, somewhat distressed look. It's it has a little bit of pull up from the wax, but not as much as, as other leathers like chrome Excel has less than that to put depending on the color, but it's, it's very robust. It's, it ages really nicely if you'll actually put the time into it to uh, to get it to age down. But yeah, it's not. I'm. I guess I'm not surprised that it's not more widely used. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was more. If it if it got it started to get used a little bit more because it's. It's awesome. It yeah, seems it's nice. like it seems it. like people really like it. And I and I like the name. We were talking about bad names last week, and Whiskey Predator is a really good name. <laughs> I have a recollection about this leather and hopefully John Colleton listens to this and corrects me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this leather was originally developed for Timberland Boot Company, if I recall correctly. And I think possible. you're I think you are also right. So it was sort of a look that I believe I don't know if it was customer directed or tannery experimented directed, but I think you're right, like a new wax was it the H one wax. I forget the name of the wax. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember that one. It's yeah. like a medium softness wax, and then they blended it with an, a harder one. So I think it's got a wax blend combo on it that's slightly softer than something that would be on the Dublin, which is more like a like a paraffin. So it's softer than a paraffin. But yeah, it kind of has that like chalky, distressed look to it that 
is definitely different. And I don't remember what the scene was like back then, but I think it was a pretty aggressive statement. I don't think a lot of people are doing stuff like that. And it seemed like uh, that's an, here's another word, like a, ch a checked look where you would get this white wax sort of break was a, a trend that happened for about 10 years after that. And I remember talking to John about this. He's like, people don't like that anymore. And that sort of faded away like five years ago. I still like it, like a check, a white checked look. Like when you creased it and it goes white instead of. Yeah. 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 That's a, it's a cool look. Yeah, you can put you can put white, you can put pigment in with the wax. So when you when stuff creases it, that's I mean that's one of the ways. But yeah, he uh, Voltaine continues with the question about leather thickness regarding Predator. So does it come in a range of thicknesses? Yes. What's the range? Um, I think we've done up to nine ounce. Um. That's a that's an interesting question, or it leads it sort of leads into a different point where there there are there are leathers that we do in like what we'd say like a full like a full range of weights, which would be you know like three and a half ounce, like all the way up to like twelve ounce, and then there are certain leathers that we don't do that with, where like you know, lightweights only you know, up to five ounce, because when you start to get onto the the heavier the heavier raw material, it doesn't either it the break doesn't doesn't hold up well or it's it doesn't lend itself to the kind of product that um that you'd make out of the, that heavier stuff uh, which which kind of is a lead into the, the second part of that question about weights because there are certain certain weights that are good for certain things and not for others and there are looks and and with with boots and shoes at least there are look like aesthetic looks and patterns that are that require you know, some, some combination to achieve the desired end result. And I, I think that a lot of times they want, I think that the, what I'd heard is they talk about like the, the, the shoe like package. So like the lining, whatever is in between the lining, if there is something and then the upper, they want that to be like a, for most shoes, like most high quality shoes, they want to be like around seven ounces. So depending on what, what all, like what you're putting together like that sort of dictates like what you're ordering at at what point so if you if you're if you have your upper leather figured out and you, this is what you want to use then you sort of can figure out what else you need to pair with it and then vice versa you know if you you've got i don't know a Gore-Tex membrane and like that's informing what the finished weight is going to be then you're going to use you're going to talk about that first and then I mean that's pretty thin but you're going to talk about that first and then fill in around it so so the weights are and he, in the question, he said, you know, that this, some of the stitch down constructions use heavier weights and the Goodyear welted stuff tends to be in a range that's a little bit below that. And then sometimes there are some guys that go even heavier. So it's, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of pattern and preference, I would say, is the, is the real answer. I was just thinking that you started to hint at different shoemakers and different styles of shoe or boots might prescribe a different thickness for the upper and the liner and it's my perception that the pacific northwest stuff has like a chunkier aesthetic like very for lack of a better word tanky <laughs> like built like a tank and it I, if i recall correctly a lot of that pacific northwest stuff is for the upper is just like seven ounce and i bet they're using like a four ounce liner i don't know yeah i mean a lot of those some of those aren't they the shafts aren't even lined. I mean, they're just, they're just what they are. But well, that's, that's, that's actually the other thing is like an un, you can have a mega comfortable unlined moccasin made out of five ounce. So I think, I think there's something there, at least from, from my experience is that the thickness of the leather, if let's say this as a simpler example, Chrome Excel, I can make myself a camp mock in five ounce, Chrome Excel unlined and it would be super comfortable. If I made that same shoe with the same pattern in a seven ounce, I think it would be slightly less comfortable. This is where my brain goes. I, th I think at, at least out of the box. But then I think once you once you wear it, 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 it there's a break in time, of course. But I, I su suppose that they become equal equally comfortable in the long run. But it's just a lo much longer break in period for the thicker stuff. Yeah, I think that that's 
Yeah, I think it's de- I, I, again. I think it depends on the pattern because we look. You look at like some of the leathers that we do for hand sewn specifically because that's a that's a, a good example. Where like a boat, you know, like a regular deck shoe or a boat shoe or whatever, tends to be right in the weight you were talking about. But there's still there's a lot of leather in that shoe. But then you've got a very similar shoe. I'm, I'm thinking in my head. I'm thinking about Quadi Moccasin had a ring boot. Mm. which was like leather all the way around. And that ounce. thing was, yeah, it was yeah. crazy heavy. And and I have something like that from them. Yeah. I mean, and that's, but the pattern is different. It's, it's got a different, it's laid out differently so that the heavier, you know, the heavier tannage or the heavier article works. It's almost like but, it's unlasted too. Yeah. They, they like people. Is that a word? Not lasted. Being, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I remember being at the factory and like, they have to, like space out hand sewing those because it like ruins people's day because they're so hard to sew because it so they're so beefy but the maybe that's part of, it could be ease of construction i that's that's something i didn't think about right away went slightly off script from the predator chat there but it's interesting how much predator keeps coming up in comments i need to get myself a pair of predator footwear maybe maybe from uh, nick's boots uh, another another question comment here, Nick, from it's me BK on YouTube. He is waiting for an Ashland Rose Anvil collab, and I think what he actually meant is something that I did not realize until I just read this comment. Uh, when I put it in our notes, I thought he meant something else. I think he was talking about the collab of that video that we did together. <laughs> but what what's funny about that is uh, Weston messaged Nick. And myself about doing a collaboration, Roseanville Horween Ashland collab, and we had we had a phone call about it, but haven't come up with anything yet. So the reason I put this in here is because I was wondering if people had any ideas for what a cool collab would be between the three brands. Definitely let us know because uh, we have some ideas, but I'd be curious. It would be I would be curious to hear what you would like. All right, another YouTube comment from a Google user. Question not related to the video. I have a pair of Mr. Lou boots from Baker's. They're Horween Black Horse Hide. Does that mean they are horse foot or are they strip or are they from the front of the horse? Is all horse specifically not horse foot? Does it supply? It seems like there's, it's, it is very confusing, Nick. Break it down for us the different cropped parts of the hide on a horse hide. There's obviously the, the hides come in, they're whole. And then we cut them at like, a, like kind of like picture like the waist, I guess. And we end up with the fronts, which are thinner, like around like two, three, maybe four ounce at the most. And those are good for jackets and linings and some shoe, some shoe uppers, as long as what we were just talking about, as long as you've got the right kind of materials going along with it and the right pattern. And then there's the back, which is what we really want, which is for which is where the shells are, which will become shell cordovan. And so at that point, those two pieces go in completely different directions. You know, the, the butts get vegetable tan and the fronts will go, I mean, they could be chrome tan for chrome Excel, or they could be you know, any number of, or we've been doing some vegetable tanning, like shrunken stuff lately. That's pretty awesome. So they, they go completely different directions. They're totally different products. And he mentioned the strip, which is an, which is a piece of leather that's can, that's, that is part of the butt that we've cut away from the front that's not cordovan. So we don't know exactly where the shells are, how big they are at this point, because the, you know, the hair is on and we haven't done anything to expose the shells because we've talked about how those are inside the hide, they're not on the outside. So we don't know exactly where they are. I mean, we have, from experience, we can kind of guess, but we definitely don't want to cut into those. So we cut, we cut ourselves a, like a little bit of a margin like of, of safety. And by the but, way, that is the answer to his question is they're made from the strip. For these particular boots yeah yep yeah, yeah so the so the the strip gets cut away from or we, we cut away some of the leather that's that doesn't contain cordovan doesn't contain the shells about 45 days into the process and then that piece of leather we call the strip so it's, it's a pure vegetable tanned leather um that can that can then be made into not so many different products a few but chrome excel is one of them so I'm, I'm, I, I don't know exactly which boots he's talking about. I think I have some idea, but I think that those yeah, are link from they're engineer boots uh, with the black horse strip, 
yeah. The interesting yeah, thing, so, about, thing about that is like other tanneries call this the horse butt or horse rump. Yeah, so like when you buy or when one, not you necessarily, you Phil, but when when someone buys like a, like a horse butt from, I'll, I'll just say Marianne because they came up in the last episode. Like you're getting the whole back of the animal. You're getting the part that that is shell and not shell. So when we sell cordovan, you're not getting anything that's not cordovan. I mean, that's that's like one of the things that we we kind of like pride ourselves on is we we're very careful at exposing and removing anything. So like that piece that you get, it might be compared to other shell cordovan places, it might look smaller, but it's all it's like 100% cordovan instead of there being margins or or the strip is still attached or something like that. But but um but yeah, so the that is like if you get horse butt from some other tannery there's part of it that's shell and part of it that's not shell so the the strip is like i guess like it's horse not, butt not shell. junior horse butt light because yeah. it's it's still it's still uh it's still thick it's it still has full weight compared to the front but it's not it doesn't include shell so it's kind of a it's a really nice leather and it's really very very well actually quite versatile if you kind of figure out how to use it but the limitation is just the the sh- shape because it's like it's above the two ovals in the back and then behind the front, so it's sort of like what it's kind of like a I don't want to say a leftover, but it's kind of like a between two worlds kind of. A thing. I mean, the shape looks like a mustache, and it can range in how wide that mustache is. So it could be like a cell, like a Tom Selleck, or like a French artist. I don't know. I can't think of it. <laughs> What's a thin mustache? Yeah, well, and yeah, they they could be, they range in weight from you know, like five ounce up to like you know over nine. Oh, ounce. I'm talking about the shape of yeah. The, the yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, so but the weight is all over the place, and then that they could be three inches from top to bottom, or they could be eighteen inches, and the the it's like anything in leather, like the big ones, like the eighteen inch that have good consistent weight that are not all scarred up, like those are awesome and easy to sell. But it's like those three inch pieces that might be a little stained or whatever. It's like, what do you do with that stuff? Because we don't throw, we don't throw, or we try not to throw anything away. Yeah, they're just too small to cut any yeah, pattern but, pieces out of. And the selections but, but, are pretty rough off. Yeah, we have to pick out the nice ones for boots. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I mean, they're a lot of, a lot of, I think the best, some of the best patina that I've seen on specifically on like engineer boots and boots in that family are on like that the chrome excel horse strips there. i would say it's that awesome. version of chrome excel is maybe the best version because it's pit tanned chrome excel it's it's almost like chrome excel in name only it's like kind yeah. of you know but it's just it gets, a, cro- it, it gets a little chrome but yeah it doesn't get chrome in the base tanner yeah. it's a more dense version of chrome excel i did i do notice as with most veg that's been tightly packed in, it tends to have a little bit more of a loose break um, when flexed, especially in the thick ones. What know, does the... The horse butt chrome XL? Sometimes. It depends. I, I think it, I think it's like it's like just like every other chrome XL. It's like it just depends on... Yeah. The, there's well, a lot I know of factors. You, um, I think the compacting of it after... The, it's just my experience that the pit tan or veg stuff, maybe not all, that has more of a tendency to become loose, um, especially when it's bec- when it's rolled or glazed by packing in all that. Maybe uh, that's yeah, of depends. sugary break that has more of a sugary break as well. Yeah, and it's I very think grainy. I think it's hard. Yeah, it is. It can be. Yeah, I think I think it's it's hard to be general, um, but that can definitely. That can definitely be. I, I, having said case. all those negatives, I think that's the best Chrome Excel in my yep. my opinion. Do you yeah, disagree? It's good. Do you like Chrome Excel Classic better? I do like I like Chrome Excel. I like OG Chrome Excel, natural, hard to top it. All right, I got another YouTube comment here from We Wear the Mask, and they want to know about sneakers and casual shoes that use Horween leather. Actually, they asked for an entire episode on this. I'm going to make you do it in five minutes. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Good there's uh, there's some good there's been some good stuff in the past. It's uh it sort of comes and goes, I guess. I guess it depends on also what you're what you're thinking of with sneakers because we've done try to do what we want brand like brand. Yeah, um, I want. I mean, I personally would like to buy some sneakers. So tell me who they are, what what they look like, and where I can get them. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I should. I should look at what's out there. I mean, in the world for sale right now. Like I know, you know, Crown Northampton is out there, and um, Allen Edmonds I think has a sneaker type option, and New Balance does at times, and Adidas has in the past. I don't think they have anything now, and then there was a Converse, a Converse. I was gonna say collaboration, which is always like such a kind term to the tanner because like they just told us what they wanted and we just <laughs> did the work for we just we just worked for them. But uh, there were some van, some cool vans like skate shoes a number of years ago. Um, and there's the Visvim stuff, which is a little bit off the wall. But those are some of those stuff. I some of those those shoes are definitely sneakers. I don't know who am I forgetting. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Other than. New Balance. Who's making a sneaker in the U.S. out of Horween? I know Alan Edmonds makes oh, yeah, things in right. a few different places, but I'm not positive where that shoe is made. I know they do the Cordovan yeah. Park Ave sneaker. I bet that's domestic. Maybe maybe it's not. I don't know. You know, it's not. You don't see it in sneakers. Our stuff in sneakers as much because it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not easy to make into a sneaker because it doesn't want to be glued uh, in, in many cases the traditional stuff you know chrome XL, for example it, like if you're going to vulcanize the shoe you also have to sidewall stitch it which is something you see less and less because the after a while the the glues get defeated by the the high oil content so it's a little bit of a difference a little bit more of like an old fashioned uh sneaker unless you use something with lower oil content and then the glues are fine depending on the glue and the prep to the leather i have a pair of the dr j converse in i think it's actually beaufort chrome XL. they're awesome and they did the one i have is mostly color eight with black chrome XL accents and they did the opposite of that too which body of the shoe it's like a high top it was black with their burgundy accents is so odd. i still like that but i would say my favorite and i don't know if you've seen this one you probably have my favorite sneaker that your leather has been a part of was some Latigo that New Balance did. And I believe it was like a 101 Latigo. Color number 101 is like a light brown. I think that's what it was. It's either that or like a light sand sort of color. My business partner, Dan, has those. And they're, they're just so <laughs> they're so awesome looking. And uh, I guess they made them once and never did it again. I think New that Balance the... kind of does that, right? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I don't. I think sneakers in general are kind of like that. We also did Latigo for them, the Visage Latigo, which was like yellow Latigo that we would finish brown on top, and then they would cut everything and then leave the edges all raw. So like the, the side of the New Balance end would be yellow. And they did it with, I'm just remembering two colors. They did that like brown, like kind of like a chocolate, like a milk chocolate brown on yellow, and then they did it with a black on a red. It was pretty. Perfect plug for my brand, Nick. I was actually looking <laughs> oh, no. today. We're, we're prepping out some new wallets for a private stock event. And this episode might come out after private stock. I'm trying to release the thing this week. And we did some black on red Visage wallets. And it's so cool. It is cool. The, I'll explain Visage quickly again. But there's a very variation on Horween's Latigo where you mill dye it or drum dye it a particular color. So in this example, we're talking about red and yellow. So the all the core of the leather is red or yellow and then you stain a different color on the surface that gives it a really cool just depth especially like nick said when you don't finish the edge at all and just leave it all exposed you get this this look and then there's a variation of that that's called sandwich latigo which i know other people make like sandwich versions of of leathers but that sandwich one is all done in the drum which is equally interesting because they'll use a dye that penetrates all the way through the whole substance. And then they'll use uh, a different dye with less uh, in the tannage 
uh, in the formulation of it, they'll won't allow the dye to penetrate all the way through. So you end up with, let's say, a red core with black on the bottom and the top, and that was all done like a Easter egg dyeing in the in the drums. Pretty, the sandwich stuff is pretty cool, but it's yeah, you difficult the sandwich to stuff use it. Yeah, use it. You use it. Like there are certain dyes that and, and drivers that will push the dye all the way through to the center of the leather, and then like at the very end, you throw in black and you only run it for a few minutes just to just to coat the outside of everything. And it's kind of it's kind of think about. I mean, everyone talks about T core. It's like T core, but then you're choosing the color of the core that you want. So it, t- it tends cool. it tends to be dark colors only because you're finishing over whatever color is inside. But but it's uh it's cool. I, I like it. It's super cool. Right, we got another question here from Doran. Hope you're doing well, old Nick. So I have a question regarding color on brown chrome XL leather. The boots in question are Allen Edmonds Higgins Mill. I've had them for a couple of years with some decent wear. Over time, I've noticed that one of the boots has stayed darker almost chocolate brown while the other boot has lightened a noticeable but not crazy amount with a lot more red tone showing up with a lighter brown shade. Is this more of an issue with the clicking of the hides being different for each boot? Is there a way to lighten the darker boot, for example, sun bleaching, or it would be a good way to darken the lighter pair, like putting some color, some fear boot cream on it? What do you think? I mean, it could be a lot of things. It could be he could, you know, he could have a desk job and sit in the window and like his left foot could be closer to the window and the other one could be, you know, under his desk or whatever. I mean, I've got, I have a pair of boots that I've been wearing, uh, the woolly Chrome Excel Vibrix I've been wearing for the Thunderdome. And I was looking at my shoe and like the back of my one, the heel on one of the boots is like told, there's like no dye on it. And I was like, what am I, am I? like rubbing my foot against my chair or like when I'm driving the car, is it like rubbing against the rug? And then I realized that, and it took me, you know, only took me 40 years to figure it out that I take, I always take off my left shoe first and I take it off with my right shoe. So I'm scraping off, like I'm scraping the heel with the toe of the right boot every single time. And then my left, I use my left foot to take off my right boot. So with my sock, so it doesn't happen on that side. So there's like a lot of little things like that, that add up or can add up, but it could have also been, you know, two different dye lots. It could have been, you know, Allen Edmonds, they're, they're a big company. So they could have ordered Brown Chrome XL twice and it would have come in and it could have been two different batches and could have, you know, been the same color on the table when they were cutting it and they could have done a fine job and it could have just been a variation from, you know, could have been our fault or fault might not be the right word. We could have been from us in coloring like the, or in, in dyeing, like we may have had to put an additional dye coat on it to make sure the color you know hit their standard and then that would that would you know over time affect sort of the the you know how it would wear but i would say always if you want to do something the darkening is always better than trying to lighten uh it's more it's a more forgive well, i don't know if it, forgive me something it's it's a more um controllable process but i would say if it's not bothering you i just would just keep going and there's going to be at a point where they're both the same color that's just that's just it all goes to sort of a this it you know if it's the same if it's almost the same color brown they're going to go to basically the same color at some point it might just take a while but but yeah i mean if you want to dark darken it try it out put a little uh what what would you put on there to darken it i'd have to see i'd have to see the yeah doran send us a photo man yeah, because I mean, maybe me, it, some dark, some some dark brown, some dark brown tinted, I don't know, something shoe shoe cream, and you know, dilute it with some natural of the natural shoe cream. But then you're putting shoe cream on, so you gotta you gotta contend with that. I don't know it just depends on it depends on what it looks like. And I'm pretty surprised yeah. to hear this because brown chrome XL, from my experience, was pretty consistent in it terms is, yeah. of of color on the surface and the pull up. So that that is a surprising one to me, but thinking of everybody doing the right job, it's possible that it did look different on the surface color, and then once they put it around to last, the color changed a bit, or maybe the tannery missed a, a swab or something. I don't know. No way. Yeah. No way. That never happens. I, I honestly, I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen that happen. What two different colors like that on one, like on one batch or one load? Uh, I mean, I've I've seen it well. 
No, I've seen. I've definitely seen plenty of shoes that don't match. I mean, it could, it could you know, he they could have been those shoes could have been on display, and one of them could have been in the box, and the other one could have been in the window, even for like a couple of weeks. And See, that makes more sense. May, may have not noticed it when we first bought it, and it could have gotten because so that would be you know the sun is bleaching out or or lightening the the shoe that's in the window. But that's pretty common. I see that a lot, like with especially with um. Well, I, I see it. I see it often. <laughs> you were about to trash somebody. I think I was about to trash my own my own product. Well, I was. I just know that there's been experiences that retailers have putting product in the window and trying to reorder that product that's been sitting in the window, change color. Yeah. Yeah, I went to I went to a uh, a retailer who I won't name, and they had a bunch of Essex just accessories like uh, underarm like portfolios and wallets and stuff and they had a whole section of blue wallets and stuff but the blue was like gray unless you flipped it over and then it was blue again because they had like they had just been sitting like in the window in one like only up for a long time so the t they was like a complete two-tone it had taken all the blue had been bleached out to gray why is it why is that essex not so color stable and I'll, I'll give you my my story and I'll let you answer. It's well, there's two reasons. I mean, well, let me either, give you my story. Okay. Give me, give me your story first. <laughs> I thought you wanted, I thought you asked the question. I said, let me give you my story and then I want you to Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Right, all right. I love natural Essex. I think it's the best wearing leather that I've ever experienced, but I've stopped using it for my products because it turns pink and it's often very difficult to keep that lighter color clean, but that's not necessarily exclusive to Essex, but it seems very much instable. Uh, for color, I'll let you respond. You have two minutes. To, yeah, you have two minutes to respond. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> the, Do you agree? Yeah, sometimes I think that it does. It can get it can get pink. Uh, I think I think it does tend to dark and keep darkening though. Is in the sunlight, and if you are using it, it'll keep going and it won't stay. It can get it, it can get a little a little bit nude or buff colored and then it, and then it keeps it'll keep going and it'll get dark brown but that's i mean there's that's that darkening that's happening from the oil and dirt and ultraviolet that's that's affecting the the tree barks that are in that are in there you know it's darkening it's just you know it's just like the same thing like if you were to just like put a piece of wood in the window like it's not going to stay hmm you know, it's not going to stay looking like a new piece of wood. It's going to darken. It's going to start to darken and oxidize and counterpoint. Fade. Allow me to respond. Point, point, counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I notice if I keep the natural Essex, well, this might be part, partially to your point, but if I keep it in a sealed plastic bag, it doesn't change. So I, I suppose it has something to do with the air or oxidizing. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. So that's the case with natural. So nat if natural leather tends to get darker, and then darker leathers will often get lighter because you're cha you're not changing the underlying tannage. You're not, you're not affecting the tree barks. You're affecting the color that's been applied to it, and that wants to go the other direction. So greens and blues and burgundies, hmm. um, in my experience, tend to fade. They 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 just are more susceptible to UV for whatever reason. But there's a bunch of ways to get around that. I mean, you can put it on top coats that are UV resistant, and I mean, even if you just know that that's gonna that might happen, then you can manage manage it a little bit. You know, don't put it in the don't buy a blue chair and put it in your window if you want to stay blue. It's just a, it's just a real shame because I again loved the patina on that natural Essex and stopped using it. Do you have a I should know the answer to this if it exists, but do you have an alternate product? Not really, because I think that it, to to kill that pink, to kill that pinkiness, we'd have to change the retainage, and then it would just, it would just be a different, a different product at that point. I think I think we'd have to adjust the bark the bark blend. So a direct replacement to Essex. I mean, not. Uh, you should get to work on that one. I think I think that. there's. You know how much I love uh, like the horse butt strips that are not the Chrome Excel version. I think a horse front pit tanned, just a pit tanned horse natural horse front 
would be pretty sick. And the, I suppose the challenge with it would be the weights and the selection. So you're not going to sell much of it except to me. So that's, <laughs> yeah, it's going to take, take a long time and uh, the raw materials not super predictable and yeah yeah it's not it's it would be awesome but it's not like a very commercially viable right. option but that doesn't mean we wouldn't do it because we do stuff like that all the time i'm taking over the q a neck <laughs> sorry right. to call the you're asking questions and then i'm i well we're I, I don't think you're taking over i think we're i'm just so selfish because i want better leather for, or like better i want more interesting leathers um, um. Which, by we the just, way, we just we just touched on some, on some one of the reasons that we don't you can't always do everything like crazy because it's just it, well it's it's is it is it cost effective and like can you sell it? I mean, because we we develop stuff all the time. We're like this is awesome and it's nine dollars a foot and then no one's like I like it's awesome but no one's gonna pay you know whatever the price is that you have to charge for it and that's just like okay we just we're just not gonna. We're I hinted at one of those things earlier when we were talking about grain character. Your dad developed. I don't know if it is old, but he has a piece of woolly horse hide Chica finished like Chicago. So it's finished. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not that old, but yeah. I mean that. It's cool. There's no market for it, but it's so nice. It's <laughs> it's so nice. <laughs> but it's yeah, just so it's thin. Not, it's not. We. It's not. We can't make enough of it for it to be interesting for for anybody. I mean, like I think we had, you know, like a like 50 horse hides that were like, oh, these are really thick and they're like, don't have any holes in them. Like we should just make something that something cool. And then we make it and then it sits on a shelf for three years. And then we find it. And we're like, this is awesome. Let's figure out what to do with this. Your dad wanted us to make something for him. So we did. And then he's, he's like, Hey, take the rest of it and make some stuff for yourself. So we're, we made a private stock wallet again. I've nice. been my own smelling my own farts here, <laughs> but it's maybe the coolest, uh, like grainy leather that I've seen. So uh, props That's to you cool. and to you and Skip. Let's go. Uh, let's keep sniffing those farts and move to the last question here from uh, Stuart Wallace, which I believe this is a YouTube comment. And Stuart wants to know why don't we hear more about Helm or Rancourt? And I thought this was a really appropriate question because I feel like we don't talk enough. Of, I don't know a lot about Helm, but I feel like I know a lot about Rancourt and we, nev we never bring them up. I try not to, in in general, like just to single out brands like for better or for worse, just because I don't, I think that everybody is good at doing different things and I don't want to, I don't want to seem like I even can pretend to know or tell them how to do their business. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a ton of good manufacturers and makers out there i think even rancor is interesting because there there aren't very many people doing like the traditional main hand sewn anymore and i think i mean they might be the only ones that are left that, that are doing it at any kind of scale um so that's that's interesting but it's uh, all it's yeah. interesting and sad that such a huge thing is not so huge anymore well nobody i mean because you that's there's an interesting aside there it's like it's just it's in order to make like a like a true traditional hands-on it's expensive and there's a lot of leather in that shoe that you don't even see because it wraps all the way underneath your foot so it's kind of like a shoe someone was describing this it's kind of like a shoe that's upside down like where normally mm -hmm. you've got the upper that's stretched over the last and then you're sewing like a midsole underneath it like a hand sewn you're like you're cutting the 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 vamp the front part and then that's wrapping underneath your foot and then you're putting like the, the plug which is like the top that goes over your toes you're putting that on top of the shoe so that's why that's what it means it's a moccasin so you if you didn't put a if you didn't put a sole on that for you know a boat or whatever then you could still walk around on it because it would be leather all the way underneath your foot so that's a very expensive way to make shoes because there's all this leather in it that you don't even that the customer doesn't even see so there's there's a lot of the you know quote hand zones that are out there don't they're kind of like faux hand zones like they don't the leather doesn't go all the way underneath your foot i mean it's still you know they've just they've sort of adjusted the pattern to use less leather it's not something that you would necessarily see but when you wear it it's different it's definitely different the, to make it that old the traditional way is um it's better but it's, yeah it's not it is not as uh cheap to do it that way they got some beautiful looking stuff here i haven't looked at their website in a while 
I remember maybe they stopped doing. I'll speak out of turn here. I remember they were doing a lot of Blake Stitch stuff. I think they even had a boot called a Blake boot that I do not see here anymore. So maybe they bailed on that. Um, but the moccasins. Are these moccasins? Loafers and yeah, moccasins. Stuff looks nice. I mean, it looks the same as it's looked when I was into this more heavily, you know, 15 years ago. It's awesome. That's the way that boat shoes work. Yep. I will say that the, a competitor of Rancourt's uh, from Oak Street, I will say the most comfortable things I've ever worn are unlined brown Chrome Excel boat shoes. Or they were like the five eyelet, whatever. I forget what he called them. But it's ultimate comfortable. I love those things. And I to get some more some more because I've really worn them out. But yeah, we don't give um enough props to to Rancourt. And that was something I was thinking about when we were talking to Nick at Stridewise too, is it seems like there's a lot of um interest in new and exciting and that's not sort of not Rancourt. Right? Like it seems like there's a lot of content made Indonesia's sort of a new thing, right? And that's very exciting. But it's kind of boring to talk about like I love Alden. It'd be pretty boring to talk about Alden make a video about an Alden shoe that's existed for a hundred years and hasn't changed. I disagree. That's a reason that's not boring. I don't know. Like how much content can you get out of that? Right. You get one. That's it. It's all, that would be great. But I mean, how many different, you think they're, they're inventing new ways to make shoes all the time? Yeah. Well, that new ways. Yes. And I mean, patterns can change. Mm -hmm. The material selections can change. Colors can change. I don't know. Maybe it, I, I just feel like there's these older brands, Rancourt, for example, that it looks like they're trying actually to do some new stuff. Like I'm seeing some cool suede colors and I'm noticing that Blake boots not there anymore, but it does seem like they've identified we've got some of these hits and they're just going to make the hits, but they're not doing monkey boots, right? <laughs> no. No, it's not their. That's not their. Uh, that's not their thing. I, I guess they don't have a, a. They're not that. They're not that old a company though. They are. Rancourt. Yeah. Older than me. Um, two thousand and nine. What? Okay, yeah, I've but, been doing uh, a lot there longer than Rancourt. No, no, you haven't, because because they're the 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 current factory, the current iteration is from two thousand and nine. But um, the family and Mike Rancourt has been, they've been making shoes for yeah, forever. Since like, well, uh, like I'm, I'm sorry, no, since like the um, 60s. So yeah, wow. Yeah. I bet yeah. you this, this, some of the styles they're doing today are the same styles from back then. Yep. All the hand sounds. <laughs> Anyways, I, I don't have a fully formed thesis there, but I was thinking a lot about you know, what's interesting to talk about in like a YouTube video or what's the coolest thing to post on, like what you're wearing for the Thunderdome, right? And like it'd be kind of, I don't know, I would wear it, but you're not going to get a lot of style points for having something that people have seen, right? I think, I think that's where I'm getting at is whatever. <laughs> that I will say that is a detractor for me for that, that forum is like it's just like what's the weirdest thing? Yeah. Like, what's the what's the most exclusive thing I can get and wear? I mean, that's it's cool look, too, though, right? I mean, I get it, no, it is cool. I get it. It's cool, but I think it. I mean, for me, I mean, I guess. What, what, I, I mean, of course, I'm going to say this, but I want to see like 15 different pairs of natural Chrome XL worn 15 different ways, and I want to see how that how they're different each time. Like, I want to see a painter and a and a construction guy, and I want to see you know, someone that does the drives for a living or I, I want to see, and I want to like at the end of it, I want to see how different do they all look. Cause they'll, they'll all have wear on them, but like, which, you know, what do you, which one do you like? So, so I think that, I, that's interesting to me, but you identified know. the other thing that bothers me about the Thunderdome. One of the other, th there's a couple things that concern me about like that don't make it for me, but it's a six month process, right? You pick your boots, you wear them from new to six months. That's like not even the start of the journey for me like i'm more interested in that painter after six years right i I think that's much more interesting but that's a much harder event <laughs> to have 
somebody posted a photo for six years. Um, so that I guess that's my problem with is like I ended up I have so many things that I love that I've had for over a decade that I just don't I can't wear them all. So I'm like I just want to keep wearing the stuff I already have. I like it. I've been wearing. Uh, I guess he's in town tomorrow. I've been wearing my Cordovan uh, Rancourt plain toe. It's like man, I miss these things, and it has been a winter time here, and so I haven't had much chance to wear a boot like that. Uh, and I missed it, and I was wearing some other stuff. It's just like I have so many things like I already love. I don't want to get. I do want to get those monkey boots that we talked about. Uh, in the last episode but it's funny you said like i i was texting with brett today and then i I missed my chance to call him because i was i wanted to call him and get his um comment on or like just his take on what what came up in the last uh episode oh about about how he was trashing viberg for no reason just like the change in the (laughs) sorry the perceived change in the last well, according to them, like eight or nine years, like if there or seven or eight years, if they're, if they're, even if they're, or if there was a change or if it's just been, they have different pictures and their prices have changed. I mean, cause that's, I, I mean, wonder. it seems to me like the only thing that people could, I guess I haven't seen all, all many of their shoes, but the ones I've seen look really nice. And I think the, the thing that is very easy to pick apart from them is the price is really high. So I kind of get it. But yeah, well, Nick, but Nick was from Stridewise was saying like the quality to price to like style was great. Like, like they're Venn, they're like right in the middle of that Venn diagram. That's like a really good. If you look at all three of those, it's like a very good value. But it's still I mean, it's still a nine hundred dollar boot or whatever it is, or eight hundred seven eighty or what I mean, I don't I think they're all different prices, but pretty expensive. It's an expensive. I would say very like in line with some of the Edward Green type pricing, though. I don't know if he's looking at them so much or like a european yeah, well, green i think green is more expensive but it's yeah. also a, a completely different like radically different piece of footwear in my oh for sure but it's the yeah. it's the finishing of a non-pacific northwest shoe in the form factor of a pacific northwest boot right so you're saying he does more finishing i think his finishing is pretty refined And I like it. And I don't think yeah. that's not what he was doing before. He wasn't doing a lot of the rolled edges. He wasn't doing a lot of like a stained and waxed and like really nicely yeah, right. polished and filled in like midsole to outsole like that area. Yeah. I like I like the blend. I, th- I think the, the Pacific like the Pacific Northwest stuff is nice and I like it, but I don't I don't find it like and it's well, I think for date for date like day to day, especially for me, it's great because I don't I'm not a fancy person. I don't work in a fancy place, but for like if you wanted to have something that's more versatile i think that going a little bit more refined is good but i mean if you have 50 pairs of shoes i mean like whatever i don't know i have the pair that i have from him are are of the old the old viberg that are less refined and i love them i just kick them around i like i like not having to worry about my stuff yeah and i also like when things get beat up so to me it's i'd rather have a smaller price tag but I don't know if it's actually for me. Like I'm not the guy. Yeah, I don't know how much of that is. It would be interesting. I'm never, I'm never sure if, if you'd be able to get like a straight, accurate answer. Like how much of that is customer service? Like how much of the price of the boot is <clears throat> just dealing with the crazies that are like my the stitches, thirteen degrees off. Like I'm not, I, I gotta send these back. These are these aren't perfect. So I mean, if you're sending, if you're mailing boots back and forth all day long because people have such high expectations of your work, I mean, what like what does that do to your price? I mean, it's got. To, I mean, it has. To, it doesn't have no impact. I'm a little so worried about what you just said. You you triggered me, Nick. I tr- <laughs> you, you, I'm just. I don't I'm think just saying, these people are crazy. I think they should get what they think they paid for. I think that I agree with you. I agree with you. I just think that. There are sometimes, and I'm sure people are going to be like, well, if I spend my, if I'm going to spend $900 on a pair of boots, they should be perfect. It's like, okay, well then, I mean, maybe they should, but it, you have to think about like who's making them and how they're made too. Cause there's, there's a certain amount of, I mean, if they're handmade and they have to be handmade to be, 
to, to go through that construction process. And part of the price is coming from the fact that they're handmade and they're, they're that construction. Then there are some sort of like human elements to it that are just inherent to the fact that a human was involved. So to want something that's perfect, I think is a fantastic goal. And like, you can always aspire for that. And I think that that's the shoemaker's job is to try to make something that's as perfect as possible. But, but to get something that's not totally perfect and then to be like blown away and like, you can't figure out why, why this is happening to you, I think is a little bit misplaced, but I get you bring, bring on the, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to, I'm sure there'll be mm-hmm. people that are saying, you're only saying that cause you never have to pay for your shoes. <laughs> yeah. Well, to echo what you're saying about the customer service cost. I pay for my shoes, by the way. The uh, if you recall from a year ago, we had Wyatt and Josh in from Grant Stone, and they said one of the hot, most expensive parts of their footwear is the customer service. And I think even since then, they've added on because I interact with them, and I think they've like doubled their staffing here in Michigan. And I think it's mostly customer service people. Um, and I, I, I get, I, I could see why that would happen. We. I have a lot of customer service questions too. It's it's a it's because the the sizing must be such a disaster for a footwear brand, and then oh, yes. they're using materials that are not plastic, you know, not the same necessarily every time. I, I, well, they, I think they were tough. saying like they'll send shoes for someone to try on, and they'll like wear them for like like wear them around the house for the weekend, and then they send them back and like these don't fit. And they're like, yeah, but you wore them. Like they're all creased up. It's like, why well, didn't wear them outside? It's like, <laughs> my brother gets so mad at wallet customers. Um, well, we'll take back a wallet if it's you know unused <clears throat> for a full refund. And <laughs> sometimes we'll get them back, and it's like, <laughs> like so, so obviously worn. Yeah, I, my, do, I came like this. My <laughs> brother goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to be telling me you never wore this? He gets so mad. But it's, 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 it's part of the gig, man. I mean, if it was a great... So that's the thing with my product, and I'll throw myself under the bus. Like, If it was an awesome product, and if it worked for that guy, he wouldn't have sent it back. Like, if it was worth it to him. You know? Yeah. So I just look at that as like, hey, we could have done better then. But like sometimes it's like, you know, it's just not the guy's style, right? Yeah, sometimes there's some, there are some people out there you just can't make happy. Also, and there's a percentage of those that you are going to deal with. And what you're going to do? You're one of those people, Nick. Am I? No, you're not. You're okay. you're a cool guy. I got very nervous. Got do you want to do any favorites? Do you have any favorites, or should we just go to bed? Um, <laughs> I was trying to think about a favorite on the way over here, and then I started thinking about something else. Would you? Would you, maybe if you have something, I have little, something. Thanks, jog my uh, for jog my thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> I am buying every favorite episode from here on out to reference this band until they organically hear about us and come on the show. But I really like Fallujah. And they... (laughs) You've done this once before. (laughs) (laughs) They they just announced that they're doing a 10th anniversary remaster. I'm not sure if it's a remix and remaster of The Flesh Prevails, which is my favorite album that they have. And I've been listening to it since they announced that like every day for the last week. It's so good. And uh, I'm going to drag my wife, who does not like technical death metal, to go see this show in Chicago. Shocking. And, yeah. You should come, Nick. You want to go? Sure. I like Fallujah. Oh, it's so good. And Fallujah, if you're, if you're hearing this, come on the show. I'll talk about you every episode until you show up. Yeah. But I'm not going to reach out to you. You have to, somebody has <laughs> to find you that knows like, like your buddies and send them to the show. <laughs> That's funny. It's not. It's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, no. Austin, my bandmate, runs Audio Tree. I should. I told him I was like, you got to get Fallujah in the studio, because it would be per, it would be awesome. It's just uh, it's really interesting the the larger, and they're not even a huge band, Fallujah, but the larger these artists get, the more barriers there are between them as individuals and stuff that they can do so you have to like Mm. the band has to go through their management to go do anything it's i don't know it seems like a disaster it's like when i reach reach out to people to be on the podcast and they're like let me 
you have to talk to my assistant first. It's like, okay, I get it. You're big time. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one. So you you told me, I think you told me, was it last, you said last episode or a couple of episodes that you have some um, Merriam boots from Grandstone? From or Oak, Oak Street. Street. Or the street. natural horse run. So I'm going to plug a non-Ashland wallet. <laughs> you suck. No, good, good. <laughs> So I've got like from time to time I'll and this is this is a this is a plug but also a favorite but I hope but from it's time price, to time uh, it's it is nice. yeah it yeah. is yeah from time to time I'll come across like a shell or two just like through production and I'll be like well that's really nice like like it's super smooth or like the thickness is really even or the color is if it's a marbled like the color is like really awesome and I'll just like pull it out for with for like no reason other than like I want it which is a crazy thing to still experience like have worked at a tannery and like lived at a tannery your whole life but uh so I'll pull it out so I end up I end up with like this these little stacks of like interesting stuff and I had one of those like piles of like it was you know probably 12 shells of like all different but I picked I took a few of them and I sent them to Christ in Germany because he's made some laws for for our site in the past and he I was just like just make as much stuff as you can out of the stuff I was like these are the products that I like like just just get like just waste as little as possible so he sent me like a whole batch of stuff that's it that I've taken pictures of that I haven't put up yet and it's marbled color eight and um glade uh, color four and glaze natural and just like some, it's like really, really awesome stuff. And like in, and everything like keychains and NATOs and wallets and like sunglasses cases. And it's, so I'm like, I'm going to put that stuff up, but here's, can you take here's me one. and like, here's one. oh, never mind. Yeah. Is that color four? This is, this was unglazed natural when I started. Sheesh. Yeah. It's gotten super dark. I was going to say, I've been you carrying this for, send me some like, photos that I can put on the video here. Yeah. I've been carrying this one for maybe a year, but it was, I mean, as light as it gets when I started with it, but. So anyway, so that's a favorite because I, I was gonna, I was gonna tr- swap wallets the other day, and I was like, nah, I'm just liking this one because I, I think I mentioned also I've got like a box full of wallets that I have worn like more, more wallets than anyone needs, but yeah, um, it, yeah. So Christ, so it, and even if you don't, yeah, or two, <laughs> <laughs> even if you don't, I mean, look, you can like, there'll be some stuff up. I'll have some stuff up for sale soon in that, like this wallet specifically, and then a couple others, but. Just if you're looking for, like, he makes bags and belts and it's just stuff is just really nice. Is Very it like re- ChristLaterManufacturer.com or something yeah. like that? Yeah. And then your stuff is on GenuineHorweenProducts.com if people want to check that out. Yeah, HorweenProducts.com. But if you just go to oh, Horween.com and click on shop, it'll take it's you It's not there, genuine. I, Let me look that up. It's just Horween Products. Oh, you're right. Okay. I may have, I may have also, I may also have Genuine Horween Products. Look like at all these sold out brushes. I know. I got to get some more stuff. Who makes the brushes? Solgarb mm. in California. Yeah, they're cool. Those headphones are not doing well, huh? They're not so good. <laughs> I missed the mark on that one a little bit. I mean, they're awesome headphones, but I just think that it's a, that's a tough market. The more I uh, look, there's just so many, there's so many awesome options that it's hard to it's hard. I think it's hard to stand out and it's not, I'm, I wasn't really working to stand out. I just did something I thought was cool. I and will say cool, I, I'm an in-ear, as you can tell, I'm an in-ear guy, but those, those are really nice. They yeah. definitely put you in the room. I liked um, them. Yeah. I like, I'm like, I, I like these a lot, but they're, I mean, they're not as expensive. They're a little bit. I have to apologize to you. I, I've only used that headphone amp you gave me the USB C one three times i kind of like it yep. too yeah i, just I like it i was I, using it before we started i was listening to music with it i never thing. listened to music with um this thing yeah i never have a USB-C device to listen to um i'm yeah, always cool. listening to airpods on my phone and i have the old phone with the lightning yep old it's not even that old <laughs> anyways uh thanks for another episode nick Thanks. Everybody, thank you for checking out the show tonight. Um, people have sent in questions. We really appreciate that. And like Nick said, it's our it's our favorite thing to do. So please keep the questions coming. 
Uh, and if you have suggestions for what we should do as a collab with Rose Anvil, that would be good to know. And let us know who you want to see on the show. If we got some, I've, I've reached out to people that you have suggested to try to get them on the show. And uh, I, I will reach out to people if you ask me to have them on the show. So please keep sending those. I appreciate it, guys. All right, I have one more thing. I will say I did, I did get one email through our site um, from a Mr. or uh, excuse me, a Dr. Edward Santelli. And I don't have a great answer to your question today, but I will reply to your email. Oh, wow. A bonus so, question at the end. You want to read it? No, it's about it's about uh, Marine Field Chew and some of the places, some of the places that are around the country that may have used it. And he was asking because I think some of his family members were in the industry. He just was asking for a little bit of info. And I, just, I, I, oh, like other I was, tanneries that made it. Other yeah. tanneries and shoe manufacturers. I need to do a little bit of digging to give him like a satisfactory answer. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say I got your email. I wanted to shout it, shout it out. But man, that'd be so. Cool. Thanks for the email. Yeah, like tie up the family tree for this guy yeah <laughs> oh i don't think so but um it's cool it's a cool question yeah to answer all right, all right nick have a all good right, night thanks, man. Bill. Bye.